I recently watched the movie 13th on Netflix and I thought there was some really important information in that documentary and for those who haven't seen it or who can't see it, I wanted to share that information with you so if you don't want any spoilers from that movie, uh, don't watch this video. I'm basically going to be repeating what they said in the movie because I didn't know this information and I feel like a lot of people don't know this information and I think it's necessary things in this movie that everybody should know. And so it's quite a long video and that's why I'm going to be making it into different parts. 13th is a Netflix documentary explaining how the justice system and the prison system today is set up to be a type of modern day slavery where people's rights, particularly black people's rights, are being taken away from them and it's on a mass scale. America is 5% of the world's population, but it contains 25% of the world's prisoners. So that's one out of every four person living in the land of the free that's locked up. The U.S. has the highest rate of incarceration in the world, and it went from 1972, the prison population was 300,000, to present day, it went up to 2.3 million in America. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution makes it illegal or un unconstitutional to be held as a slave. It basically grants freedom to all Americans except for one exception or a loophole, if you can call it that, which is if the person is a criminal. So basically it allows a black person to be held as a slave as long as you make it look like they're a criminal. And after the amendment was made, white supremacists basically took this clause and ran with it. Once slavery was over, white people suffered economically because they no longer had these slaves to work for them for free. And they had Jim Crow laws which segregated and oppressed black people and so black people fought their way out of that and then the white people felt that they had to think of a different way and a more stealthy, uh, sneaky way to oppress black people and keep the rights and all of the money in white hands. So then they dump all the black people into prison, so now you've taken away their right to vote and their ability to get a job, so now it's just back like Jim Crow's or during slavery. For the Civil War, black people were arrested in masses. It was the nation's first prison build, and they were getting arrested for extremely minor crimes such as uh, vagrancy or loitering and then forced to provide labor to rebuild the South, uh, the economy of the South. Propaganda was started in the media against the black male, making him appear to be violent, um, untamable, uh, dangerous, and they would show them in animal-like demeaning ways which created fear in white people. KKK were out there killing people under the, the idea that they were committing crimes such as rape. But if you think about it, who are the real criminals? Black people were just coming out of slavery, just trying to be respected, trying to gain rights, trying to be treated like a human being. But who's out here burning people, lynching people, even after slavery? The white people kept killing and murdering black people. So who are the real criminals? Where you see big populations of black people today in specific cities such as Detroit, Oakland, Harlem, people migrated a long time ago to those cities uh, not as immigrants looking for career opportunities but as refugees fleeing from terror that was happening to them in the south. It became illegal to have such open lynching and terrorism performed by the KKK. It shifted to a more legal disguise, Jim Crow law. Laws were passed for segregation, claiming black people as second class. They couldn't vote, can't go through the front door, they can't go to school. Um, civil rights activists such as Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, they spoke up for their people, but they were labeled as criminals and they were thrown in jail. At that time, politicians or white supremacists claimed that these people, these civil rights activists, were threatening law and order. So then they got rid of Jim Crow laws, and as the civil rights movement uh, increased, so did criminal activity, and politicians claimed that the civil rights movement itself was responsible for the rise of criminal activity. Nixon was the first to talk about war on crime, which was code for 
war against women's empowerment, war against gay rights, war against black power movements. The white community wanted law and order, and politicians such as Nixon used this as a tactic or an excuse to lock up black people and label them as criminals, rather than or instead of savages and animals that they were called before. War on drugs was treated as a crime issue rather than a health issue. Hundreds of thousands of people were being sent to jail for simple possession of marijuana, low-level offenses. Nixon recruited Southern whites to the Republican side, um, persuading poor and working class white people by speaking in subtle, non-racist terms talking about crime, law and order, chaos in the streets, all unleashed by the civil rights movement. John Ehrlichman, um, who was a Nixon advisor, was caught on tape saying uh, the quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and the black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. That was a quote from a Nixon advisor. The prison population in America had risen from 300,000 in 1972 to 513,000 in 1980. And then the Reagan era turned the rhetorical war on drugs into a literal one. Reagan was determined to put it on the agenda and to make it a prominent problem in America and he used his wife to make that Just Say No campaign. I don't know if you guys remember that ad that said this is your brain and then they showed an egg and then they cracked the egg on the skillet and they, they said um, this is your brain on drugs. They used education and keeping our kids safe as a mask to make it okay for this war on drugs to happen when in reality it had nothing to do with educating youth about drug safety. And then crack cocaine came onto the scene and this drug could be uh, marketed in very small doses, relatively inexpensively, and it took over some uh, black communities. Crack, which was smokable, was a more inner city issue and cocaine was a suburban issue. Congress made mandatory sentencing for crack that was way harsher than that for powdered cocaine. So the same amount of time you get in prison for one ounce of crack cocaine, you get the same for 100 ounces of powdered cocaine. Mainly black people and Latinos that were getting long sentences for the possession of crack uh, pretty much the rest of their lives. But if you were white, you basically just get a slap on the wrist. There were huge numbers of black males that were being locked up and cut off from their families for really long time. War on drugs was basically a war on communities of color. Nixon played on a fear of crime and law and order to win the election and then Reagan piggybacked off of that promising tax cuts to the rich and to throw all the crackheads in jail. Which devastated black communities but it secured southern votes. In 1981, Reagan strategist Lee Atwater, he was caught on tape explaining the southern strategy and he said you start out in 1954 by saying N-word, 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 I'm not saying what he actually said. Uh, by 1968, you can't say N-word, that hurts you, it backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. You're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And by 1985, the prison population has gone up to 759,000. The war on drugs was gaining popularity in media and pop culture with shows like Cops. And black men were being overrepresented on the news in handcuffs as criminals. Overrepresented as in um, being shown more than what is actually accurate. It further created this idea that black people and Hispanic people are animals to be kept in cages and then white people who are watching the TV turn off their TV thinking thank God for prisons because otherwise these people, these crazies would be out here running on my street. The 
the white supremacists or the politicians were creating fear. They used the words super predator to describe black criminals. And Hillary, Hillary Clinton also used those words to describe black criminals. She was quoted saying, they are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are super predators. No conscience, no empathy. They were talking as if black males were animals or beasts that needed to be kept under control and put in cages. Even people within the black community began supporting these policies that criminalized their own children. False accusations of rape came out just as they had done back when the KKK was popular and they were locking up black men, even younger boys, and then years later they were found to be proven innocent. They put labels on black men such as rapist, sex offender, gang leader, burglar, thug. And that made it easier for the citizens of America to be okay with putting all of these people in prison. They deliberately educated the public over decades to believe that black men and black people in general are criminals and they need to be controlled. So then Bush won his election because his opponent, Dukakis, supported the policy that murderers should have weekend passes. Dukakis had a double-digit lead over Bush in the election before the campaign focused on a black man named Willie Horton, who was a black man charged and criminalized for committing a murder and rape. And before the campaign just used the name Willie Horton, they didn't show his picture and nobody was up in arms, nobody was making a big deal out of it, but then the campaign started showing TV ads showing Willie Horton's face, a black man's face, talking about how murderers shouldn't have weekend passes for, you know, committing uh, rape and murders. Then Bush um, took the lead over Dukakis because Bush supported, um, he didn't support weekend passes and Dukakis did support weekend passes. Bush won the election by creating fear of black men without saying that that's what he was doing. Willie Horton was used as an example for all black men as rapists and these uncontrollable killers as they have been just after slavery. Meanwhile, the facts state that the history of interracial rape is far more marked by white men against black women than black men against white women. And by 1990, the prison population had gone up to 1,179,000. So then it pretty much became impossible for a politician to run for president and appear to be soft on crime. When Bill Clinton won his election, um, the California three strike law was created where when a person is convicted of their third felony, they're put away from prison for the rest of their lives. Mandatory minimums were created, which no longer allowed judges um, to consider the circumstances around a crime. They would just give mandatory sentences. So they took away the discretion from the judges, which is arguably, arguably the most neutral party in the court, and they gave it the discretion to the prosecutors. Meanwhile, 95% of the elected prosecutors in America are white. And then the truth and sentencing law was passed that kept people in prisons for over 85% of their sentence. And this was basically to comfort the public in knowing that the criminal would serve just about all of the time that they were given.